Hello, I'm Kevin Snyder here for Tuts Plus. Let's take a look at the animation we're going to make today. Okay, to create this animation, we're going to utilize some GIS data. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. There's a ton of information out there on GIS. It can be a little bit overwhelming, but hopefully after watching this tutorial, you'll be able to jump in and create an animation just like this. We're going to start off by gathering some DEM data, so digital elevation models. And we are going to use that data to create our 3D geometry in Cinema 4D. Once we have that, we're going to gather some DRG data, so that stands for Digital Raster Graphics, and that's what the contour maps are. We are going to overlay that on top of our geometry and then we're going to go ahead and use the MoGraph module to animate these pins coming in. We'll utilize a couple free plugins to create this um, dashed line to follow our path. We'll go ahead and export this animation over to After Effects and in After Effects we're going to just add a little bit more to it. We'll add the depth of field to it. I'll show you how you can tweak the colors of individual parts of the animation and we'll walk away with the ability to create a map like this for anywhere in the United States. And really you can apply it to anywhere in the world as long as you have access to the data. The data resources that I have found um, are specifically geared towards the United States, but these techniques can be applied to uh, anywhere as long as you have access to the data. So enough of me talking, let's jump right in and see how we create this. The first thing we need to do is gather our GIS data. Now there's a lot of resources online and I'm going to show you two resources that have been reliable and they're also free. There's a lot of places online that um, are not free so hopefully this will get you in the right direction. These two resources will work for mapping any place in the United States. So the first site I'm at is geocommunity.com and we want to go to GIS Data Depot. And the first piece of data that we're interested in are the USGS DEMs. So DEM stands for Digital Elevation Model and that's what we're going to use to create our 3D geometry in Cinema 4D. So I'm going to go to download GIS data and we're going to scroll down. We pick the state that we want the data for. I'm going to click on Oregon. I want countywide data and you have to know the county that your uh, feature of interest is in. So I'm going to go to that will allow us. And I want digital elevation models 24K. Now one problem here is the whole United States for this data is broken up into quads. And this number right here represents the quad ID number. And if we look for just this one county in Oregon, we have a lot of different quads in here. So we need an efficient way to be able to download these quads okay, without guessing. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go back to United States. And let me actually go back to country index. OK, I'm not seeing the link. Let's go to USGS DEMs. And then I'm going to go to, to download DM data here. Okay, so this is what we want right here. We want, it says looking for USGS quad index. Here it is. So we click here. And I want the USGS quad grid. And I want the USGS 24K quad grid. Okay, because that's going to match up with our DEMs. So let's download the zip file. So now in my downloads, I have the zip file. And I'm going to go ahead and cut that. And I'm going to move it down to 
the folder for this project. Just try and keep things organized. Let's paste it in there. I'm going to unzip it. So in this folder, I have four files, and the shape file is the one of interest. It is a vector file, and it has coordinates tied to it so that we can overlay it on a map, and we can view uh, where the quads are, the quad IDs are in relationship to the United States. Now, we need a GIS program to be able to view this. And we're going to use a free program called ArcGIS Explorer. There is an online version to this as well. Okay, uh, so this is the, the standalone desktop version. The online version works pretty well, but you can't import the shape file that I just downloaded because there's too many polygons in it. Okay, it exceeds their limits. So you have to download the desktop version. Now, when you very first open it, um, you know, we don't see a map, but we can choose a base map right here. Now, one thing I will point out is I installed this on a different computer and I had several base maps included by default. And when I installed on this computer, I couldn't get any base maps to show up. So if they don't show up, let me show you real quickly how you can add some base maps to this. So if you go to add content and then GIS services, um, I selected new server connection and where it asks for a URL I put in this URL here and I'll put it on the screen so it's a little bit larger. Okay, so once I'm connected to this service I can double click on it and I'm going to get some different um, base map options here. So maybe I wanted like uh, world train base I could add the service And so now I get the map showing up and we can zoom in on this. And if I want to save this as a base map, I can. I can go up here to the little orb and we can go to save as new base map. Okay, and we can give it a name. So I can just name it what it already is called World Terrain Base. Click save. And now when I come over here to my base maps, it shows up. Okay, and that, so that's what I did with these over here. Now I don't want to use the World Train Base for this. I'm going to use just a National Geographic World Map. So I'm going to select that. And there it is. Okay. Now the nice thing is right here we can put in our place of interest. So I thought I would do um, a place a little bit different than my original demo just to mix it up a little bit. So here's Wallawa Lake. Okay. And this is in the northeastern part of the state. And we had this lake that was built, uh, was made by a glacier coming down these mountains. And so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to map out this section uh, where the lake is and then up the mountain. So we need to know exactly which quads. Sorry, I'm using a tablet here and this program's a little finicky with a tablet. So we need to know which quads we actually want to download. Okay, so let's go to add content and we'll go to shape files. And let's go to the shape files that we downloaded, our quad 24, and there's our shape file. I'm going to click open. And it's going to zoom out and here are all the quads for the United States. Okay, now I'm going to double click on Wallow Lake to zoom back in and let's zoom out just a little bit. Now unfortunately by default the lines and the quads are both yellow so let's go to appearance and we can change the fill color and just make it white maybe and the line color I'll make it black. Alright, so now we can see which quads where they lay. Okay, so I think I'm going to map this quad and this quad here. So if I click on the quad, we're going to get the quad ID showing up right here. Okay, so I'm going to copy that and I'm going to actually open up Notepad and just paste in our quad ID. And then we need 
the second ID as well. So I'm going to um, stitch this one to this one here. And I'll copy that one, put it into Notepad. Now you can obviously do more just for the sake of speed. I'm only going to do two. On my Mount Hood example, I did six. Okay, so I did six of them together, and that wasn't too bad. Um, the computer handled it all right. So really, um, ArcGIS Explorer, all we needed it for was to be able to overlay that shape file in here. So we're kind of done with, with this program. So now if we jump back to our geo community, we can go in and get those uh, DEM files that we need. So I'm going to go back over here, USGS DEMs, and we're going to go to download DM data here. We're going to go back to Oregon. We're going to Wallawa. And we want digital elevation models, 24K. And so now I can come back to Notepad, copy this one, and I'm going to do Control F, paste it in there, and there's the first one we want. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the green because that is the free download. Now there's a 30 meter and a 10 meter. I'm going to go ahead and download the 10 meter. Click OK. Let's click back now and let's see what the other number was. So it looks like it's the same number, but it's B2. So I'm going to copy that, paste it in, and there's our second one. So let's go ahead and download that one. I'm going to do the 10 meter again. Okay, so I'm going to copy those, or actually I'm going to cut those and move them back down to our data. Okay, so these are our DEMs, right? So we're going to be able to make a digital elevation model, our 3D model out of that. Now we also want contour maps to um, overlay on top of the geometry. Now we don't have to use um, contour maps we could you know make up our own textures and put them on there but for this look we're gonna put a contour map over the top of this now unfortunately on this site they do have contour maps and they're right here USGS DRGs okay the problem with the DRGs on this site is that you have to pay for them okay and if you're doing a large area it could get kind of expensive so luckily I found a resource that is free and we can still get the same information. So this map project site, they have 24K scale USGS DRGs, okay? Detailed topographic maps for all 50 states. So this is kind of nice. And this is located in the data section. All right, so let's go to data to get these um, contour maps and we're going to go for Oregon. Now we could do a feature name and look for it that way but I'm going to view the entire list of USGS Oregon digital raster graphic maps. Okay now if you look right let's see where is it right here here's the here are those ID numbers so if I do control F we can search for the first one there it is right there and I'm going to grab this TIFF file and I'm going to save it. Let's jump back over and copy our first map ID number, paste it in, and there it is right there. We're going to download the TIFF file. All right, so if we go back in here, I'm going to go ahead and cut those. Let's put them in with our mapping data. All right, so it seems like a lot of steps, but once you kind of get the hang of this, it'll go fairly fast. Okay, so this is all the mapping data we need now to go ahead and move forward with our project. Now let's make our 3D model that we can directly import into Cinema 4D. So this program that I'm using is called 3DEM. 
So it's an older program. It's not being developed anymore, but it still gets the job done. Now, this is Windows only program. So if you're on a Mac, you have to um, you know, use a, a resource to be able to run this or look on the App Store. Um, I don't have access to a Mac, but from what I gathered, it looked like there were um, programs in the App Store with similar functionality. Okay, so as soon as this program opens up, it says what kind of DEM file do you want to import? And we have USGS DEMs that we, we want to import, so we just say OK. And then we'll go down to our data. And here they are right here. So these are um, a type of uh, zipped compression um, files, but we don't have to unzip them to bring them into 3DM. We just select the two files and click Open. And there we go. Okay, there is our digital elevation um, model data. Okay, and you can change what this looks like. You can um, change the gradient so they're different colors and things. But really, all we have to do now is export this thing out to a DEM file that Cinema 4D can read. So over here, we go to File. And let me move this over so you can see it. We go to File, and we want to save a USGS ASCII DEM. Okay, and in my mapping data, I'm going to go up. Let's go, let me put it in Cinema 4D and maybe models. Let's just call it DEM. Click Save, and that's all there is to it. Let's jump over to Cinema 4D and see what this model looks like. Okay, in Cinema 4D, I'm just going to go to File and Merge Objects. And I'm going to find my DEM model that I just saved. And it's going to ask me uh, scale. I'm just going to leave it on the default. And here is our model of the area. OK, pretty cool. So we have the lake, and then we have the mountains here. And you know, if you take a look, uh, this is very high resolution mesh. If I click on the mesh, you can see it's fairly dense. Okay. So one thing about it being so dense is if we take a look at the information here, uh, we have what is that? Two million seven hundred twenty-four thousand four hundred eight polygons. Now, I'm not too concerned with this just because it's only two quadrants that we stitched together. Okay, But when I stitched uh, six quads together, my model was almost 9 million polygons. So it kind of slowed things, slowed things down a bit. Let me show you how you can reduce um, the number of polygons. Right, So I'm in R15 here. And if we go to the polygon reduction um, effector, we can use this. Now, one thing that I've noticed is this can be really slow. Okay, So if we turn on, before we make it a child of our model, we want to make sure we turn on check all the checkboxes. Okay? Because I found that if you don't, this thing will take an extremely long amount of time. Okay, I haven't even waited for it to finish um, if they're not all checked because it just seems like it's going to take forever. So once they're all three are checked, and I just leave this at 90%, we can make this a child of our model. Now at first it might not seem like anything's happening, but if we take a look at our task manager and we look at Cinema 4D, we can see that um, it is chugging away. Okay, because right at first, like I said, it doesn't seem like anything's happening at all. And sometimes you'll get information down here saying that it's reducing polygons, but I find that, you know, doing this, oh, here we go. Okay, so it's going pretty good. So this won't take 
too long. But if you leave this unchecked, polygon quality preservation, if you leave that unchecked, it seems to take, like I said, a really long time. Okay, so this isn't too bad. Once uh, the polygons are reduced, we're going to go ahead and save this as its current state to make you know one that's a little bit lower. So if you take a look here, we're reducing this down to 544,128 polygons. So pretty nice reduction. You could go even more, especially since we're going to overlay this with a with an image texture. You know it could probably still be lower, but I think this is okay. All right. So this thing is done reducing the polygons. So I'm going to right click it and choose um, current state to object. And then I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and just delete this uh, our original model. Okay. So now if we come in here. Um, it's just a little faster and and we have um, a lot less polygons okay all right very nice so the next thing we need is how do we create our texture that goes over the top of this that contour um, map we're gonna go ahead and jump over into Photoshop and we're gonna combine those two TIFF files that we downloaded Okay, in Photoshop, let's go ahead and combine the two TIFF files that we downloaded. Now, um, these TIFF files do have coordinates built into them, so that if you have mapping software, um, you might be able to stitch these together just using that instead of doing it manually. I haven't been able to find a good free resource to be able to stitch these together. Um, especially with this white border around them. So we're just going to do it manually here in Photoshop. It's not too bad, but uh, if you have my mapping software that can take advantage of that embedded data, um, it would sure be nice. So the image is in index color. We're going to switch this to RGB. It just looks a little nicer. Okay, we can do that for the other one as well. Now we we want to be able to put the other map below this one, so let's go ahead and change the canvas size, and we want to be able to put it below. Let's go to percentage. Let's make the height 200%. Okay, this is going to be a really large texture, but we can scale it um, down if we want later on. But for now, we'll just go with this size. It just kind of depends too in Cinema 4D how close you want to be able to get um, and keep it, and keep that resolution there. Okay, I'm going to hold down Alt and click on the lock. And now I'm going to take this over to our other image, holding Shift to make it snap in the middle. And then we can just bring it down. So we want these to obviously overlap. So I just need to trim off the top part of um, this second map I just brought in. So we'll just do it real quick here. And let me add a mask. And that's actually we want to um, we want to invert our selection. So let's go to select inverse. And now let's make a mask for this. And let's scoot it up. And let's zoom in here. Are these two overlap. If I can kind of lost where we were. Here we are. So you just have to get it close. Um, honestly, once you get everything um, on the geometry, it's really hard to tell where the seams are. And that looks pretty good. It's off just a little bit. Okay, which always seems strange to me because, oh, there we go. Okay, because they should line up pretty well. I can see a couple no, 
that looks pretty good. We're looking good. All right, like I said, you know, there's so many contours in here. Um, it really is kind of hard to tell if there are any errors in there. So you don't have to be super precise, but if we zoom out here, you know, this res this thing is just huge. So um, I think we're okay. So I'm going to do Control Shift E to go ahead and combine those into one layer. And I'm going to go ahead and crop this. So we want to crop out the white border. Okay, so we have just the map. And this thing is big. All right, and I'm going to have delete crop pixels because um, I'm not going to need those. So let's go ahead and say yes to that. Okay, and that looks pretty good. Okay, so like I said, it's not too bad stitching these things together. They go fairly fast. Okay, now this is a really big texture, and I'm going to leave it big just because we're only doing two quads. Um, it's not too big a deal, and I can keep that nice resolution when we get over into Cinema 4D. So let's go ahead and save this. And let's go in here to textures. And I'm just going to call this texture overlay. All right, and I'm just going to go ahead and save it as a TIFF. Now, when we jump over here into Cinema 4D, we can make a new texture, just double click. And I'm going to turn off specular in color. We're going to go into textures, select our texture overlay. And we just drag it out onto our model. Now, it may not line up right at first. Okay, because uh, here's the lake, and if we do a quick preview, you can tell this is not, not working out for us. So if we click the texture over here, and in our attributes, we want to change it. Uh, right now it's on spherical. That's not going to work, obviously. We want to go to cubic, okay? And then if we right-click on the texture over here, and let me move my window over so you can see it. If we right click on the window here and we choose fit to object, voila, there we go. Okay, let me come down in here. So this is the advantage of keeping our texture big is, you know, we should be able to get fairly close in here and let's check this out. Okay, and there we go. That's without um, that's just with the default lighting and you know throwing the texture on there so we're looking pretty good okay before we continue on with the texturing and lighting I actually want to take a step back and finish our animation of all the mapping pins come in and then that dash line coming through just to show you how I did that so I'm gonna go ahead and delete the texture for right now it's just a little bit easier to see our terrain Another thing I want to do is I want to center our axis point to the center of the object. I just think it's a little bit easier when we're navigating. So I'm going to go to Mesh, Axis Center, and I'm just going to center it to all the points. Execute. And now we have it in the center of our um, model. Let's also go ahead and reduce the number of polygons again. We've already done it once, but let's go ahead and do it again, just while working to keep things a little bit faster here in the viewport. So again, I'm going to make sure I select all three options, make it a child, and we'll wait for it to reduce. It'll go a little faster this time. And we may be able to even get away with it, with, uh, with it reduced this much, just because of that uh, texture that we put on it really gives us a lot of leeway. All right, 
So let's go ahead and make our first mapping pin. So let's just create a sphere. And I'm going to hit O on the keyboard to kind of zoom into that. And let's bring it up here. We're just going to kind of guesstimate how big to make it. And we can always adjust it. And let's make a cylinder. Let's bring it up. And we're going to need a little bit bigger than that. Okay, let's go ahead and let's reduce the geometry a little bit. We're not going to be very close to these pins, so we can get away with that. Let's go ahead and press C on the keyboard to make it editable. And in point mode, I'm going to click on that center point and we'll just kind of drag it out to give us the end of our pin. Okay, pretty simple. Click on the cylinder and the sphere. Alt G to put it in null. Let's go ahead and name this. And what I also want to do is I want to go into the axis modification mode and bring this down to the point where we want it to intersect with the surface. Okay, wherever we put this null, it's going to line up with the surface of our terrain. So I just want to make sure that the tip is all the way in. So that's fine right there. And is what I want to do is, I know for my animation, I want to start over here at the lake and then I'm going to move the camera up. So let's go ahead and start our first pin over here by the lake. And so let's just put it right there. Now, one thing that we can do to make this really easy to make sure that they're, they're lined up on the surface is if we right click and choose uh, under character tags, we can do constraint and we want clamp. And in the clamp object or options, we're going to go ahead and drag in our model for the target. And what do we want to clamp it to? We want to clamp it to the surface. Okay, and so we're a little bit off here at the beginning for the distance. We need to go ahead and bring this down to zero. And now if I drag this pin around, you can see that it stays on the surface of our geometry. So it makes it really nice to be able to quickly move our pins in here and know that they are right on the surface. Okay. So let's just start with one there. And to put these other pins in, I'm going to go ahead and make a instance of our first one. Okay, just so that if I want to make a change to all my instance instances, um, I can just change the, the master here and they're all going to change. So I'm going to do control and drag to our map pin instance and go ahead and drag it forward. Now I'm going to go about 200 centimeters away from one another. It's going to be roughly that. I'm going to change the position a little bit along the x-axis so they won't be you know exactly but they'll be close enough. So hold down control and drag. Get that one into position. Control and drag. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now, 
I think these pins um, actually, the head of the pin is a little bit big. So let's come in here and make it a little bit smaller. And so the nice thing is uh, all the pins change at the same time. Also, the cylinder is a little bit too big. Okay, so I think I'm going to, uh, for the scale, change this to 0.75. Hold down Control and hit Enter and they all change and let's actually maybe go 0.6 maybe 0.5 okay I like that a little bit more let's take the sphere and go ahead and move it down Okay, that looks pretty good. One problem is though, I've messed up my my anchor point. So if we go back to our null and go back to change the anchor point, and if I just slide this up, they'll all slide down. Okay, and again, I think the sphere could go maybe a little bit smaller. All right, so this is a great way to, um, you know, affect all our pins at the same time instead of trying to copy and paste a bunch of uh, different coordinates and scaling. All right, so let's now work on the pins dropping in. Now we can go in here and go ahead and delete our constraint tags. We don't need those anymore because we actually want the pins to move. And we're going to use a MoGraph fracture object and I'm going to select all my pins and make them a child of the fracture. With the fracture object selected, let's go ahead and go to MoGraph, Effector, Plane. And for the Plane Effector, I want the falloff to be uh, linear. Let's come in here to where it is. Let's go ahead and make it larger to make the fall off we'll just go to 100 percent so now if we come through here we can see that we can have our pins drop in okay uh, obviously we need the pins to be much higher so let's go to parameter and really crank up this Y value, so they're up out of view. Okay, so you have to adjust that accordingly to your scene. And then let's go ahead and change the scale too so that they start off smaller and then increase in size. So I'm gonna change this to negative one so that they scale up as they drop. So as this thing comes down, okay, it's looking pretty good. Okay, the other thing, well, let's go ahead and keyframe this really quick. I'm just going to do it for, um, let's just do five seconds. So I'm going to do 150 frames. And I'm going to start with them completely out of sight. Let's go to our side view here. Okay, so I just want it right to where that last pin is affected right there. And let's go to coordinates. And let's set a keyframe along the Z axis. And then come out to 150 frames. And let's go all the way to that last pin is in position. Okay, about right there. I'm going to go ahead and save this. All right, so we have our pins dropping in. And let's go ahead and add a little bit of a bounce when they hit. So with the fracture object selected, we're going to go ahead and go to MoGraph, Effector, Delay. And for the effector, we're going to change this to Spring. So let's get in here where we can see it a little bit. We'll hit F8 to play it through. And now we have our pins dropping in. And it's maybe a little bit slow. We could have this go a tad bit faster. 
in the animation window is what I want to do is select both of our keyframes and I'm going to go ahead and make them linear okay because I don't want to ease out and ease in I don't want that soft interpolation so now if we hit F8 not bad but it could definitely be faster so let's maybe come out to 100 frames Well, part of the thing, part of the reason too that I'm not liking is our plane effector is a little bit large. Let's go ahead and make it a little bit smaller, maybe. Okay, next is the dotted line that comes through here. And I'm sure there's a ton of different ways to do this. Um, I want to show you how how I did mine. So for the fracture object, for right now I'm going to turn it off, and so the pins are just stationary. And I'm going to use a free plugin called Uber Trace, and it's really nice. There's some options that aren't um, available in the MoGraph module, and you have to be kind of careful with this one. It it does tend to crash a little bit. Okay, so make sure you're saving when you when you go to use this. Uh, I just saw from the developer he is creating um, a new version of this, so I'm really looking forward to the development of that. But we're going to use Uber Trace, and like I said, it does save or it does crash a little bit, so I'm going to go ahead and, and save right now. And with Uber Trace, I'm going to go ahead and lock down the window. And we have some different options. We want to trace. All of our objects we want to connect them and we want to connect them in a chain okay so with that selected I'm gonna to go to my fracture and I'm gonna select all my pins and I'm gonna drop them into uh, trace link a and now you can see that we have a path going through here for a now if they're not being connected you can take a look there is a limit distance on by default so if the pins are too far away they may not uh, be connected, okay? But I think we're okay here. Now, just to make things nice and stable and uh, not cause too many problems, we could leave this and and we could go forward. But I think just to make sure things are stable, I'm gonna ha go ahead and press C on the keyboard just to convert it into a spline, okay? And for the type, I'm going to go ahead and change this to, let's try, so we could maybe do, I want to give it a little bit of a flow, you know, a little bit more of a curved line. So I like that. And I'm going to go ahead and move it up just a little bit. So it's up because part of it's being buried. Okay, just get above the surface. And let's go ahead and add a rectangle. And the rectangle, I already know, is going to be way too big. So let's just bring this down for a starting point. And then we also want a sweetener. All right, so we have our sweep nerve through here, and you can take a look at the rectangle. It's uh, a little big. Let's go ahead and there we go. So I'm making it white, and actually let's go ahead and make it red so it's easier to see our spline going through here. Now let's go ahead and make it um, dotted through here. So I'm going to use another free plugin and this one's by Tools4D and we have Tools4D stipple modifier and we just make that a child of our path. And so now we have it stippled and let's go into the object and one problem that we do run into on the sweep, we want to go ahead and turn off banking. OK, 
okay? Because um, as this thing animates on, it's going to cause us some trouble. So with the modifier, I want to go ahead and, so it's making an entire loop through here. And I was hoping adapt the length work, but it doesn't. So let's turn off connect. There we go. Okay, so now we have our stippled path. And we can come in here and you can change the count. I actually want to change my rectangle here. Um, I'm not really liking the shape, so let's change this a little bit. Maybe we should decrease the count so that they're a little bit bigger. That looks pretty good. All right, so on the stipple middle modifier, we can change the minimum. So as you can see, this is uh, a really easy way to animate our path coming on. So at frame zero, we want this to be at 100%. So let's set a keyframe, come out here. I think we're at about 100. And we're going to bring this down to zero and set a keyframe. And let's just take a look at the timing. And we actually need to come back to our fracture and turn it back on. And now let's run it through here. And my path is going much faster than my um, map pins. So I want to just space this out a little bit. And maybe let's not have it start. Go on. Let's maybe have it start a little bit later. All right. Uh, that looks pretty good. Obviously, we could you know tweak the timing of this uh, quite a bit more, but for now, I think we're just gonna say that looks pretty good. I'm gonna hide that deformer. Okay, so let's go ahead and add our texture back, and we want to make sure that this is on cubic. And let's go ahead and say fit to object. Um, and let's go ahead and actually, so it's reducing the polygons again. So I've noticed that sometimes with this on here, um, it likes to recalculate it, which can get a little frustrating. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it off because I think we're looking, you know, a lot of the animation is done. Uh, let's go ahead and make a couple secondary um, materials. So I'm just going to do a red color for the top of the pin. I'm going to add a little bit of luminance to it just to make it pop a little bit. I'm going to make it reflective and increase the blurriness. Okay, so we can come in here and on the map pin. And then let's go ahead and I want to do just a dark gray color for the pin. Let's make it reflective. So just doing some basic textures here for the pin. And then for um, our path, I was thinking about maybe doing a brown color. 
and let's add a little bit of luminance to that too. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, um, as far as the lighting goes, the thing that I found that I really like is just using the physical sky. And it does render fairly quick, which is nice. Let's see what time it is here. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, that looks pretty good. Um, Yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, one thing that uh, I like that I added to is I added just a a regular point light. Okay, and I just brought the intensity down quite a bit, just to kind of fill in some of the shadows a little bit. And let's go ahead and change out the soft and maybe see what that looks like. I don't think we need a, a shadow being cast from that. Let's go ahead and turn up the intensity just a little bit. Let's go ahead and make it a little warmer. I like it because it helps kind of soften the shadow a little bit um, from the sky. Maybe I might just do a little bit more. Okay, I like that. So let's go ahead and so obviously this is uh, fairly narrow, right? So like I said, when I did the Mount Hood one, I did um, it was three quads across and then uh, one down so I had a total of six so it gave me a little bit more room to work with than I do here so it's gonna be a little bit narrow but I think you still get the idea so let's go ahead and just put in a camera move here so let's add a camera to our scene And we'll start with the camera right here. And then let's come out to 130. So maybe 110. And let's just move our camera. Okay, and we'll set keyframes and let's just see what this camera move kind of looks like here.
All right, so uh, pretty simple, not anything too drastic. Let's take a look at, let's come out here and let's just render, do a little render, see what it looks like on the lighting out here. Okay, looks good. Let's go ahead and set it up so that we can modify this uh, look a little bit more in After Effects. So under Physical, no, sorry, well, sorry, Object. I want it so that when we get out here at the very end, it's well past. So our last object is right there, and I want the focal distance to be past that object. And let's see where it is when we start. So I think that focal distance of 2000 is fine. Let's go over to details and set the depth of field map front blur. And we want it to be um, back here, right? Kind of close to where the camera is located. Okay, so that's where our um, depth map is gonna start. And so I'm just going to get it fairly close to the camera to give us plenty of room, right? So basically we're saying that from this point to this point, that's going to be the extent of our um, black and white map for our, using depth. So we could render the, uh, the depth blur here in Cinema 4D, but I want to do it in After Effects. So it'll just be a little bit faster. Okay, also let's give us um, as much flexibility as we can in After Effects. So I'm going to right click on our geometry and add a compositing tag. Come on. So let's give it an object buffer number one. And with our fracture, if we want, we can um, right click and choose uh, external compositing. And then in After Effects, we'll have a null layer for each one of these map pins so that we can add additional elements if we'd like to there. Let's go ahead and on our sweep here, um, we're going to add the same compositing tag. So I'm just going to hold down Control and drag up. And I'm going to change that to buffer number two. And let's see if there's anything else that we need. We could add a compositing tag to this fracture as well if we want to adjust the look of all the map pins. So let's go ahead and do that. So control and drag. I'm going to apply number three. Now, this does render fairly fast. One thing that you have to be aware of with all these little fine lines is where it gets really dense, you get some flickering. So to help reduce that, let's go to the anti-aliasing settings. And I'm going to go to best. And like I said, it does render fairly fast. And you know, since I don't have to render a lot of frames, I'm going to change this to 4x4 four four for the minimum and 8x8 eight eight for the max. And I'm going to drop this down to 3%. So for right now, I'm going to leave it at 2x2 uh, two two and then 4x4. Four four. Um, it does slow it down quite a bit, but it just help, really helps clean up those lines. Obviously, we're going to also add depth of field to this in After Effects so we can, you know, cheat a little bit and we can get away with, with, without cranking this up too high. Okay, so it is taking a little bit of time, but uh, it'll be done by the time I need to work with the files. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it right there. Let's go ahead and add our multipass. So we need to go to multipass object buffer. We have number one. And then we need one for uh, object buffer number two. And then we have object buffer number three. And let's go ahead and pick a location for this. I'm going to go ahead and save it as TIFF files. And if we come in here,
We'll give it a name, uh, compositing project file, yes. We will go ahead and um, save it for After Effects, include 3D data, and we need to enable multipass there. So I'm just going to name it multi underscore because we have several objects that will be saved with that prefix. And let's make sure on output we have 0 to 110. I'm going to go ahead and render this. I'm going to go ahead and take this down to 1280 by 720 just to speed it up a little bit. Um, I am doing 30 frames per second. I'm not in a big rush to get this done, to get this render out so it'll be okay. And I think we are ready to go ahead and send this out. Before we jump over into After Effects I just wanted to point out that in the multipass options we also need to add depth so that we have a depth map to use in After Effects to give it that depth of a field blur. Okay, so make sure that is added before you hit render. Let's jump on over to After Effects. In After Effects, let's go ahead and add some more elements to this animation. So I'm gonna press Control I on the keyboard and bring in the AEC file generated from Cinema 4D. We get three folders, mapping pins, solids, and special passes. In mapping pins, we get our main comp and our RGB pass. So I'll double click mapping pins. And let me actually show you. If we scrub through here, we have our animation. We have the pins coming in, and we have nulls attached to those pins. Okay, if we press tilde on the keyboard, we can see the timeline by itself. Now, the way that the mapping pins were created in Cinema 4D, uh, we have a lot of nulls associated with each pin. All I want is the sphere because it's the head of the pin. Everything else I'm not really interested in. So I'm going to come through here and select everything but the sphere. And I'm going to just go ahead and delete those. So we just have the heads of the pin. So if I wanted to come in here and add some text maybe to the head of this pin right here. Let's say that we just want to add the elevation, maybe. OK, so I'm going to hit F4 so that we can toggle this to a 3D layer. And we need to find the null associated with uh, this pin right here. Now one thing I want to do with the nulls is hit S for scale and bring these down to like 1% so they're just centered right in the middle of the pin. So let me see which one. There it is right there. I'm going to hit P for position and select position, control C to copy. Let's go to the beginning of the timeline. I'm going to do control A and then twirl these up. On my text here, I'm going to go ahead and Reveal position and control V to paste our position in there. So if we scrub through here, now we have the text tied to that pin. We need to rotate it around. So W on the keyboard, rotate around the Y axis. Kind of get something we think looks good. Maybe let's scale it down a little bit. And if I hit A for anchor point, we can scoot it over just a little bit and maybe change the opacity down just a little bit. And I think I might actually change the color to that brownish color. Okay, so now when we scrub through here, we have the elevation and obviously we could attach anything to these pins to add to our animation here. Okay. So another thing we can do is, 
let's add a little contrast to this map now to give myself room I'm gonna go ahead and um, turn these off and I'm gonna go ahead and shy them and then hit the shy layer uh, button here just to hide them so I want to add just a little bit of contrast to this I'm gonna do that with curves Let's put that on our RGB pass and I'm not going to adjust it a ton, just a little bit. Now that's affecting everything when I uh, make that adjustment. If we want to make an adjustment to just part of this, we can do that using our special passes. So we have our multi depth, so we're going to use that for our camera. And then we have object number one, so we have a Luma mat for just the map. We have a Luma map for just the dotted line, and then we have a Luma map for just the pins. So this is a great way to be able to make adjustments after we've rendered out of Cinema 4D, and, and instead of going back to Cinema 4D and rendering everything out again, we can just make adjustments here in After Effects. So I'm gonna double, um, I'm gonna duplicate our RGB pass here, Control D, and I'm gonna bring down multi multi object 3 because I want to adjust my pins and nothing else so I'm going to come down here now one thing to be aware of is we do have all these hidden layers you want to make sure when you put it in here that it doesn't accidentally get put um, in the middle of these you, we want to make sure that's right on top of our duplicate here okay Okay, on this duplicate, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of curves. Actually, I'm just going to reset it. And I'm going to hit F4. And for the track map, let's change it to Luma. And now, when I come in here and adjust this, we're only adjusting the pins by themselves. Okay. And I think I want them just to be a little bit brighter in the highlights. and that looks pretty good. Now what about this path in here? Let's say that um, now I don't like the brown, I want something else. Well, we can make an adjustment to that as well. So I'm going to duplicate, duplicate our RGB pass again, Control D, and I'm gonna go ahead and put it up here at the top of our um, RGB passes, and let's go back to our project, and that was object number two is our path. So I'm gonna bring that in right above our duplicate that we just made. Let's double check, make sure that it is below all these sphere nulls. It is. And now with this one here selected, let's go ahead and change this to Luma as well. And I'm gonna use hue and saturation. So obviously we could change the saturation. We could make it just gray if we wanted. We could really blow it out. The other thing we can do too is we can colorize it. And let's increase the saturation a little bit. And now if I rotate this wheel, the, the colorized hue, right, we can make it uh, whatever, color, whatever color we want. So maybe I want it to be blue and I'm going to bring the lightness down a little bit. Okay, and so now we're able to turn that brown dotted line into a blue one. And maybe let's make it a little bit brighter. Okay, so these um, buffer passes are a great way to make changes after the render so you're not stuck with, um, you know, whatever you come out of with Cinema 4D. All right, one last thing that I want to do is add that depth pass. So let's jump back over here. Here's our depth pass. So I'm going to put it just down at the bottom. And we can actually turn it off. I'm going to go ahead and add in a um, adjustment layer. 
And let's take a look at the um, depth pass really quick. So this is a black and white gradient showing, um, you know, different depths. So as the camera goes, you can see the gradient changing. So things that are closer to the camera are white, and then as we get further away, they get black. Okay, so we're going to be able to use that data to apply blur to specific parts of our um, of our project here. So we are going to use camera lens blur. We're going to apply that to. We're going to apply that to our adjustment layer. And in the adjustment layer here, it's going to ask, well, what layer is providing the blur map? And that is our multi-depth. And if we increase the blur radius, we can kind of see where it is. So it's back here in the back. And we want to change the blur focal distance. So here at the beginning, So I'm going to leave the blur kind of cranked up right now just so it's easier to see kind of where we're at. So I'm going to start with a blur right there at the kind of the beginning where this um, pin's going to hit. I'm going to set a keyframe and then come out here to the end. And let's change the blur distance a little bit. So there's other third party filters that do this as well and they kind of do it a little bit better, but um, I wanted to use uh, the built in tools here in After Effects to do this. So now if we scrub through here, we have that nice shallow depth of field. Now it's a little bit um, extreme, so I'm going to decrease the blur radius just a little bit okay and there we go so one small problem that comes up is we have uh, this text here and it's not part of the depth map okay and so it kind of falls apart a little bit here so I'm gonna bring that above the adjustment layer and I may have to that doesn't look too bad. We could fake it by adding a little bit of blur to this, a little fast blur, and keyframe it uh, to make it look like it's a little bit more a part of the scene. So this is just kind of a fast little cheat here. So right, right here, this should be a little bit blurred. And I'm just going to set a keyframe. And then as we come in, we'll decrease it. OK, so that's one option. Another thing we could do as well, instead of applying a fast blur, is we could come in here in our camera and I'm gonna press AA on the keyboard to um, see all the options and we have the focus distance let's go ahead and turn on depth of field for the camera and let's crank up the aperture And let's actually do this. I think this will work. If we take the camera and we take our uh, layer, and if we go to layer and then camera here, and I don't think you can see that. If we go to layer, so I'm going to layer up here and then camera. Oh man, it keeps going off to that side. All right, layer, camera and then set focus distance to layer. So now when we come through here, that focus distance is set right there when that area is in focus. 
Okay, so if we press AA on the camera again, and oh, it's got to be on the camera, not on the text. Let's crank up the blur level just to see here. Yeah, so it does go out of focus right there, which makes sense because this pin is a little bit out of focus. The focus area is right behind it. And if we scrub back, there it's in focus right there. And then it and then it's out of focus again. So that's a much better way to go about it just because if we have text along all these pins, we're gonna be able to um, you know just kind of set up our camera and it's going to adjust the focus as we go. So I just crank that up to kind of see where we're at, but that looks that looks pretty good. All right, so obviously after we get out of Cinema 4D, we have a lot of other options that we can deal with here in After Effects. I hope this was a useful tutorial for you. Uh, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of places I'm checking out that I've been to that it's kind of fun to see in 3D geometry on the computer. So if you create anything cool with this, as always, shoot me a link. I'd love to see it. Thanks for watching.